Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. I, uh, I'm really glad to be here tonight. I'm glad to be sober. I, uh, I've enjoyed this tremendously because the people who uh, who I'm here with are uh, very special in my life. My old buddy Hank and uh, Winnie, God, how much I love her, and uh, Lou Ann, I haven't seen her for a long time, and uh, my grandbaby, who's going to talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Jim and all the rest of you, I uh, I just feel real good about this. I uh, I feel tremendously pleased to be here sober, just to be sober. And you know, when I uh, spend time today thinking about being sober, I don't think about uh, uh, being not drunk or uh, not hooked on any kind of dope or not. I don't think about that when I think about being sober. I think about the way I live. To me, that's what being sober is. It's the way I live. And I, you know, I lived a certain way for a long period of time. I couldn't stay sober. The way I lived, I just couldn't stay. My lifestyle wasn't conducive for being sober. I lived an entirely different way for, from the first day I saw you to this very instant and all that period of time I, I've been physically sober. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, if you knew an Alcoholics Anonymous tonight or fairly new in your first year of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I came to my first meetings with Alcoholics Anonymous and you talked to me about being sober, I didn't think you had anything to offer me. I was as physically sober when I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as I am right now. Just as physically sober. And being sober is not the answer to me. It wasn't ever the answer to me. I'd been physically sober many times. Being sober was the problem. If I could have stayed loaded, I'd have never came here. But I had problems. They kept interrupting me and my happy road of destiny out there. Little black and white cars were flashing red light. Said, you come and get with us because you're hurting yourself. Protecting me. Protecting you because I wasn't safe out there where you were concerned. That's the way I was. So if you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're confused because you're sober and you're, and you're going crazy. And you think we talk about being sober and that's the whole deal here. Let me assure you one thing. I've been close to an active and alcoholic anonymous for over 26 and a half years from the first day I came here. And if physical sobriety was all I got, I wouldn't have stayed here 16 minutes. I was physically sober. But you've given me something that uh, I believe that I was born looking for. I was born without it, I know that. And I discovered it in a program of recovery called Alcoholics Anonymous, this thing I've looked for all my life. I didn't have the slightest idea what it was I was looking for. Now, I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight fully clothed and in my right mind. I tell you that for one reason, one reason only. The longer I stay here, the more necessary it becomes for me to remember from whence I came. I don't ever want to forget that. I never want to forget a little over 28 and a half years ago, I was crawling around on my knees in a cell in solitary confinement in a maximum security penitentiary. And because of a loving God that expressed himself through this program called Alcoholics Anonymous, it's no longer necessary for me to crawl around on my hands and eat like an animal. Now, if I don't get nothing else out of this deal, that would carry me all the way home. I could live with it. I'd like to be able to stand here tonight or anywhere else anybody would listen to me and be able to tell you without any type of a doubt in my mind whatsoever. That's where alcohol and drugs took me to. (laughs) I'd love to be able to tell you that. That's where I took me to. The only thing that alcohol and drugs did in my life, they kept me alive long enough to find you. I'm just as sure as I'm standing here without alcohol working in my life. I'd have blown my brains out before I was nine years old. I've always been some type of an emotional left fielder. What that really is, it broke down to layman, just a weird kid. That's what it really was. I was just born weird. It didn't get no better. I was all right. I had problems long before I ever knew what to do about it. I was restless, and I was irritable, and I was discontent. I didn't belong anywhere. I had consumed with this wall of anger inside of me. I didn't understand, couldn't comprehend. I didn't, know what was, I didn't like anything or anybody. I didn't like my people. They made me ashamed of them. I lived in a little town in Kansas where I was born, and 
people were the town drunks. My aunts were the town prostitutes. My old man, they made whiskey. My uncles were my role models. They made whiskey, sold it into whorehouses, went to penitentiary. And I told them, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to grow up and do what they did. I was different. I smuggled dope, sold it into whorehouses, went to penitentiary. <laughs> but I was different. <laughs> Difference damn near killed me. Denial was the thing that I lived with all my life before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. They want to be like my people. My people had funny customs. And they were confusing me because I didn't understand what they did. They used to gather up on the weekends and beat each other half to death. My uncles would steal each other's whiskey and each other's women and whoop on one another and do all that stuff. Then all through the week, they tell each other how much they love one another because they're family. Now, that's confusing. You don't understand it. You're sitting there looking at this kind of stuff. And in the middle of all this sea of insanity is my grandmother. This old lady in the kitchen here with all this stuff going on, baking things and singing songs like, yes, Jesus loves me. And I didn't understand what was going on. But I had an idea. I had an idea that maybe I could be like my grandmother. I didn't want to be like these other people. I didn't want to be like the way I was. Because I knew I was wrong. I knew I felt wrong. I knew I thought wrong. I knew I was supposed to have these thoughts. I wasn't supposed to think these things about these people. I wasn't supposed to feel this way. I knew that was wrong. Nobody ever had to tell me I was wrong. I always knew I was wrong. I knew it was wrong to do these things, to think these things, and to feel these things. I didn't have to go anywhere to have them validated. I knew they were wrong. I was born with that thing of right and wrong inside of me, and I knew they were wrong. And I was guilty about them being wrong, and I didn't know that either, and I didn't want to be that way. So I started looking for a way out of this dilemma. I didn't want to be like that. And here's this old lady singing these songs, and she disappears every once in a while and comes back all lit up. Today they probably think she's smoking grass or something, but she, she's gone to church. And one day she said I could go where she went. And I went with her. I left. I was excited because I didn't want to be the way I was. I was going to sit in this place and be wonderful. I left these people that I felt different and strange, they were around and hated. I went way on the other side of town and sat down with another group full of people. And I felt different and strange and irritable and I hated all them too. And I didn't know what was going on. I was confused. And I, was long. I didn't know really what was going on. I was really in bad shape. And I sit there in this room, in this strange place with these strange people, with these strange feelings, waiting for this man in these long flowing robes to mount that rostrum that morning and tell me why I felt the way I felt. And I guess more importantly, what I looked for all my life, I wanted him to tell me what to do about it. That's all I ever wanted was some instructions on what to do out there. I didn't know. And he stood there and confused me. This heir of authority and this man of superiority, he said to me that I was supposed to love and honor and respect my parents. He said I was supposed to love my brothers and my sisters, and I didn't. I hated them. I hated them for reasons I didn't even understand. I felt guilty about that and frightened to death sitting in that church that people were going to find out I was hating when I was supposed to be loving. And I didn't know what to do about that. I turned to walk outside the door of that church that day. I'm confused. My old man's standing there drunk and hung over. He tapped me on the head that day and he said to me, Son, if you continue to go to church, you're going to grow up to be just like me. <laughs> I ain't been back to church since. <laughs> it ain't got nothing to do with church. It's got a lot to do with my old man. It's got a lot to do with my old man. I didn't understand it. I wasn't going to be like him. See, I lived in a house where there were two drunks working. That's a frightening place for little children. It's a frightening place for little kids to grow up in. Because there's sound in that house that drives you stone crazy. In the middle of the night in a house like that, they're screaming and yelling and cussing and flesh hitting flesh and breaking furniture and deathly silent. Every once in a while, the old man come got me and started kicking me around. He didn't do it to my brothers. He did it to me. I remember laying there in the middle of the night when they're gone somewhere, and that's the most terrifying time of all of them. Because I know they're coming in, and I know they're going to get me, and I'm thinking about things. I think about my uncles who live in penitentiaries. I think about my aunts who work in those houses on the other side of the track. Think about my old man who beats up my mother, my mother who beats up my old man. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and finally it dawned upon me what the problem was. It was alcohol. They drank, and they did those things. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to be better than they are. I'm going to step out into that world. I'm going to have something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to be something. But I did take a drink. You see, I couldn't be an alcoholic if I hadn't drank alcohol. I just want you to understand, I figured that one out all by myself. You just get smart here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Keen alcoholic mind. You ever stop to figure that out that the only people who ever tells you about the keen alcoholic mind is the alcoholic? <laughs> you ain't never gonna get them alamons to say we've got keen alcoholic mind. <laughs> we are. <laughs> What 
What happened to me when I took my drink of alcohol? Created a pattern in, in me, an illusion in me, that I pursued into the gates of insanity and death and beyond. That alcohol went down inside of me and tore all that madness from me. Settled that screaming madness inside of me. It took me from the black pit of nothing that just stood me into the gray friend as the business of living and installed in me this sense of arrogance that said, damn your world, it's all right. I'm not good enough to be around those good people. I'm better than those bad people. It's okay right here. That's what alcohol did for me. If alcohol still did that, I'd still drink it. Somewhere in that lottery of life out there, it quit working. And if you're alcoholic like I'm alcoholic, it'll quit working on you too. Just keep giving enough time, it'll quit working. It's a liar and it's deceptive. It promises so much and it destroys so very much. I remember from my first drink of alcohol, I thought to myself, my God, I'm like my old man. From that day until the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I never took a drink of alcohol willingly in my life. I never took it because I liked the way it tasted or because it was a sociably acceptable thing to do. I took it for one reason and one reason only. It went down in there and did something. It's still that screaming madness in there and it, it gave me that sense of air, damn you, I don't care, feeling that it gave me. That's what I want. I don't care. I don't feel nothing. I don't care nothing. In the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it explains in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous about this terrible malady that I'm afflicted with, this disease called alcoholism that I have. It says that in the latter stages of the disease of alcoholism, in the latter stages of the disease of alcoholism, the alcoholic is no longer drinking for relief. The alcoholic is drinking for oblivion. I believe that I was born in an advanced stage of alcoholism. I always drank for oblivion. I wanted out. I took a drink of alcohol and three days later they pulled me out from underneath a bridge and stood me in front of a judge and sent me to the Hutchinson State Reform School. Twenty years later I took a drink of alcohol, they pulled me out of a car and constant and stood me in front of a judge and sent me to twenty years in the penitentiary. Every time I drank, that's what happened to me. I got drunk and went places. <laughs> I went to junior reform schools, to reform schools, to senior reform schools, to junior penitentiaries, to penitentiaries, and to nut houses. Oh, those wonderful experiences of better living through electricity. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if anything goes wrong with this public address system, I won't fix it. <laughs> and if the light goes out, we'll just wing it. <laughs> I don't know about you. Some things you just don't forget. You know, you know that? <laughs> Wandering around halls forgetting who you are. I get a kick out of them. These name tags sometimes reminds me of being treated. <laughs> oh, that's who I am. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where do I live at? <laughs> oh. Well, you see, it's what they do to people like me. It's what they did to people like me because they didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know what was wrong with me either. I didn't know. My mother took me out of a reform school and took me to California. I thought it would be better in California. My mother said it would be better in California. It was worse. It was worse. It took me with them. Wherever I went, the problem went. Whatever the problem was, the longer the problem existed, the worse it got. Because I was a dreamer and an illusionist, and I got to California. Things were like they were supposed to be. I got drunk. I found out that alcohol would do the same thing me in California did in Kansas. Same thing. That's a terrible thing to understand, as young as I was. Because it's the only thing in my life that ever did the same thing twice in succession. People never did. People always told me things they didn't promise, and they always promised they never delivered. My mother said things would be different when we get to California. They were worse. I got drunk and went to juvenile. I spent three and a half years in, a, in juvenile hall in Los Angeles, going in and out of a courtroom every month with my mother. My mother come to visit me, and she said, I love you and I miss you. When you come home, things are going to be different. We go in front of a judge, he sent me to the Whittier State Reform School, my mother appealed it with her lawyer. Somewhere during that three and a half year period of time, I, I switched over and started to believe my mother. I wanted desperately to believe my mother. I wanted desperately to believe my answer was in a little white house with a picket fence and a tray full of cookies and milk. And, you know, I thought that would be wonderful if I could just have that. I always looked for just that, if I could just have that. That was my last illusion before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. If I just had that, I'd be okay. 
I understand that today. I understand it very well. It's the symptoms of my illness. You see, if that's true, if that's true, if I can show up someplace and have that and make it all right, if that's true, then you see, that gives me the privilege or the opportunity to do anything I want to do to anybody I want to do it to and just show up there someday and eat cookies and be wonderful. And then I don't have to be responsible for the actions. You see, and I've always looked for a way not to be responsible for my own actions. Always. It was always their fault. My mother's fault. It was in drunken people's fault. Later on, I started becoming in juvenile officers, in policemen, the narcotic officers. I was sentenced to a boy's home in San Fernando Valley after three and a half years in juvenile hall. And my mother, with all those promises, they let me go home on a home trip one weekend after three and a half years. And I remember how excited I was because I thought something happened to my house. It's almost like this weekend. You know, you can almost forget. You can almost forget in this magnificent setting and all this love and, and sharing and fellowship and things we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. You can almost forget what it's like on the other side of the hill. That there's a real world out there and we've got to go back out in it tomorrow. And we better have something with us. They're there out there. You know who they are? <laughs> They're the reason we're over here. For <laughs> I didn't know that. It's always my problem. My problem was always out there. My problem was never in there. You know, institutions were never my problem. Here's my answer. You know, the first time I ever got sentenced to an institution, they raised my standards of living. It's true. First time I ever slept between sheets in my life was in a reform school. They just set up an illusion and images and lies and deceptions in my own head that I had to live with for a long time. See? Sitting on a street corner one day on a furlough from a reform school, sucking on a bottle of Marco Petri red wine and quit working. Quit working. Terror wouldn't leave me. The madness was all about me. I didn't know what to do about it. Frightened to death. I'd lived in anticipation taking that drink for two weeks. Guy handed me some pills to swallow these. I did it. Didn't ask him what were they. <laughs> Are they prescription? <laughs> I, just, I didn't care what it was. It didn't work. I took it. I found out if I ate pills and drank wine, it took care of business for a while. Then then one day sitting on a street corner eating pills and drinking wine, it didn't work no more. And a guy stuck a needle in my arm. The next 14 years of my life, I stuck needles in my arm, made pills and drank wine, went in and out of institutions. Lived out in the streets all the time. Lived out in the streets, go to jail a great deal. That's right, I lived out there in the streets. I came from the streets, I lived in the streets, I was in the streets. Do a lot of strange things out in the streets. I had to do a lot of strange things because I had to be supplied in jail. That wasn't such a bad deal after all. Took the pressure off for a while. And then things started to accumulate and I started going downhill and my disease got worse. And the people started to leave and evaporate. And the medicines and the chemicals and the combination of chemicals I was putting in my system were no longer doing their thing. I'm starting to start to be in trouble as long as I'm awake. And I start to accumulate material things. 1948, 49, and 50, I had all the dope in southwest Los Angeles. Had a big apartment building. I lived in the top floor. Had a closet full of $300 suits, a big automobile. People come around all hours, night and day, begged the big man for favors. The big man granted them a favor every now and then. I couldn't leave the apartment because every time I did, they jumped on me and took me to jail. He used to get real brave about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd drive up and down the neighborhood in my big automobile in one of my $300 suits. I got nobody around me to impress about what a big man I am anymore, and I'm not impressed with me at all. And I'm asking myself questions now. What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? Why can't I be like my brother? Why can't I just go to work and have a wife and a couple of kids? Good guy, what's the matter with me? I didn't know. I just didn't know. I'm running out of people, places, things, circumstances, and conditions, and I don't know about you. My disease, my disease, alcoholism. It's necessary for me and my disease to have something to blame other than my own self without an answer to keep me from blowing my brains out. 
And when I run out of people, places, things, circumstances, conditions, I had a great excuse. It was God's fault. It's God's fault. You don't like me. It's my grandmother. God, listen to the music in Alcoholics Anonymous sometimes. It happens all the time in it. I hear it all the time. It scares me to death. I hear people talk about it. Well, I guess if God wants me to have a job, he'll shoot it down here to the club. <laughs> Deal. Next time you get hungry, you go lock yourself up in a closet and pray for a hot dog. When God squirts you on through the keyhole, you call me. <laughs> I've been looking for a deal like that all my life. I'll tell you what I know about God. I've learned it here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything I know I learned here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've come to understand one thing about God. God will not do anything for me that I can do for myself. Nothing. Nothing. There's only been one thing in my life I haven't been able to do. One thing in my entire life I have never been able to do by myself. I have never by myself ever been able to keep from taking a drink of alcohol. Never been able to. Now, from the first moment I laid on you to write to this incident, I haven't taken a drink of alcohol or any other mind-expanding chemical. And even more important than that to me, I haven't had a conscious thought or a conscious desire to from the moment I saw you to this very instant. That's the only thing I've never been able to do. I won't ever be able to do that. I won't be able to do it tomorrow. But I didn't know that. I didn't know it standing in the cell and the visiting screen in the Los Angeles County Jail with all my wealth and my prestige and my money and property that my mother stood on the other side of the visiting screen and screamed at me that I'd murdered my baby brother. That he'd gotten into some of my poison and taken an overdose of it and died. I didn't understand that when I stood out underneath a tree handcuffed between two detectives and he buried the only thing I cared about in my life, my baby brother, put him in the ground and I stood there with all the guilt and shame and humiliation and degradation of life and I'm hanging around my shoulder. I had arrogance. Good God, where does it come from in a person like me that bows up and blocks out everything and stands there and defies the world when all the pain inside of it makes them want to die? I don't know where it comes Maybe that's part of my disease. I'm sure it is. Because it's always, it's always had a way of some type of anesthetic. It works as some type of anesthetic in me. It just, my arrogance just blocks out everything. The pain of it blocks it out. It's always had it. I went to penitentiary. I stayed there four and a half years. I came out there four and a half years sicker than I was when I went in there. Spent the next couple of years of my life trying to prove what a psychiatrist in San Quentin told me wasn't true. Told me people like me didn't change. Told me I was doomed to die in an institution. Took me down and showed me a gas chamber one day. She said, that's where you're going to end up. And I told her, not me, I'm different. I come wandering out of that place, bound and determined I had that deal beat, and six months later I'm laying in a nut house kicking and screaming. And the end's coming. I don't know that. The end's coming. But I don't know the end's coming. I want it to come. I want to die. I think the end is death. That's what I think. If I could just die. I ended up in a nut house in Fort Worth, Texas, the Federal Government Hospital. <laughs> it's a nice name for a nut house, huh? Federal Government Hospital. God, how they dress them up. Put nice names, give nice names to things anymore. Doctor sit there is one of the finest psychiatrists. One of the finest psychiatrists that the world has ever known sat across the desk from me and looked at me. And I looked at him and waited for the answer that I'd waited all my life for. I thought maybe he knew he was the finest man I've ever known, finest man in that field I've ever known. You see, I felt the same way sitting across the desk from that psychiatrist I'd felt sitting in my grandmother's knee in church when I was a child. Nothing changed. Nothing changed at all. Only had another problem was working all the rest of all put together. Now the things I was putting in my system to change that feeling no longer change that feeling. I couldn't make it go away no more. I'm stuck with me. I can't get rid of the pictures. I can't turn off the nightmares. I'm awake. I'm in trouble. I don't know what to do about that. The doctor looked at me and he said to me, Johnny, if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you wouldn't have any problems. And I tell you, if I had any hope, it was just smashed right there. I'd been hearing that all my life. I heard it as a kid in a reform school. If I didn't, you know, if you didn't drink these things, you'd be okay. Like your parents, your uncles, if you didn't do that, you'd be all right. He told me if I didn't drink those things and swallow those things and smoke those things in reform schools and penitentiaries and now nut houses, and finally at this front of this great man, I've said across the desk from this great man, they told me the same thing. You know what? None of them people ever took any consideration, ever. And they never, I guess they never do. I don't know. 
They never took into consideration when they told me that I was as physically sober as I am right now. As physically sober. I wanted to scream out, a good God, doctor, don't you understand? If you would take this madness from inside of me, I wouldn't have to put that other stuff in me. I, I wouldn't have to live that way anymore. I didn't know that. I hadn't been here. I did what I always did. I just sat there and looked at them and hated them. Because they didn't know either. They were supposed to know. They didn't know. And they proved to me, after being treated by the state of California and the federal government for 20 years of my life, how unique I was. There wasn't anybody else up on the face of the earth like me. And I came back to Los Angeles and almost died. I came that close. And for all intents and purposes, I did die. For all intents and purposes, they laid me down on my deathbed in the old Los Angeles County Jail a little over 29 years ago. For all intents and purposes. I laid there, the doctor stood in my bed and told me I was going to die. I weighed 128 pounds and I was yellow as those lights. I had my arms tied down, my leg tied down. I couldn't do anything. I just laid there. I couldn't eat, drink, do anything. I couldn't just lay there. Like a thing that I was. And the doctor told me I was going to die. I nodded at him. He left. He came back the next day and told me the same thing. I nodded at him. I'm waiting. I laid there all night and all day waiting to die. Finally, the third day, he came back in there. This terror gripped me. I don't know where it came from. I've never had it before since. The idea came to me, I may live. I may, may have to get up out of that bed and go to the penitentiary and come back out and start that rat race all over again. And this thing ain't never going to end no more. I laid there for 18 days and 18 nights. I didn't eat, sleep, drink, or do anything. Just laid there. And one night I knew nothing better to do. I screamed out the only prayer I ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. I thought for a long, long time nothing happened. There were no blinding flashes of light. Nobody come running down the hall with a dozen donuts. And we got an A meeting down there. You know. <laughs> a little bird didn't come in and drop the chapter on my chest. And I didn't wander off into the tulip somewhere. I just went to sleep. And I got better and better and better. And i tell you how sick I was. Two weeks. Two weeks after I screamed out that prayer in my deathbed, I'm up running around the jail looking for some more of the poison to put me back on the bed I'd just gotten off of. More of the poison. And I found it. It didn't make any difference to me. I got a kick out of Winnie talking about Doc. She should have walled him up. He'd have came out there drunk. Hell, they threw him in solitary confinement in the penitentiary for being drunk and disorderly. Could you imagine that? In the penitentiary, I'm drunk and disorderly. They lock me up. They come to get me 30 days later, I'm drunk and I was when they put me in there. <laughs> Gee. I stood in front of Superior Court judges and was humiliated, called a blood-sucking parasite in society. Said, hey, right being around decent people. That's true. I knew that. That was true. I knew what I was. See, I've always known what I was. I never kid myself about what I am. I've always known. I've never had to have anybody judge me. I've always judged myself far harsher than anybody else has. Still do. Nobody has to. I do. I do a real good job of me. Always have, always will be. And the most severe critic that I have is me. The man said in this room, I hid in solitary confinement on the first Sunday in November 1959. I wandered into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't take any credit for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. If I'd have known why I was coming, I probably wouldn't even come. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because the institution I was in allowed women to come in here. That's all. I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous over 26 and a half years ago to smell perfume. And I've been honking and sniffing around here ever since. <laughs> I mean, you really got to be careful what gets us sick people in here. I remember my first impression of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't ever want to forget that. I remember moving in and sitting down in the back row and what I lovingly like to call my throne of contempt. I had my coat collar up and my shades on because I was cool. If I'd have been any cooler when I got here, I'd have froze to death, for God's sake. <laughs> I remember looking up on the backboard. I saw two big gates, and I thought to myself, my God, I wandered into an anti-aircraft brigade. I didn't know what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I said to this clown sitting next to me, what is this? He said, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I sunk down in my seat. Gangsters weren't supposed to be hanging out with them winos. <laughs> if it had been Al Gangsters Anonymous or Weirdos Anonymous or Dope Fiends Anonymous or Do Do Do's Anonymous, yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous, come on. I mean, when you're cool, you're cool. <laughs> I mean, when you're different, you're different. You know why I stayed? Saw some women. I wanted these women drunk. Tell me their stories. See, I knew about women drunks. 
What? <laughs> Did I know about women drunk? I didn't see women drunks that day. I saw sober lady alcoholics. And if you don't know the difference, I feel sorry for you. I mean, these were sober lady alcoholics, and they saved my life. They created an atmosphere and attraction in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I would have died and went to hell for just a piece of the ribbon they wrapped it in. And I'm not talking about young, good-looking, well-developed young ladies. These were a couple of old, wore-out society broads. <laughs> but they had twinkles in their eyes and smiles on their faces. And they did something for me. They talked about God that day. I got up and left. When I came here and you talked to me about God, I left. God was the reason I was. No reason for me to be here. I kept coming back to your meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous then for the same reason I came back today. To see you. That's why I come. To see you. Because seeing you, I had seen the miracle. And I didn't know that either. I don't know how long I kept coming to you and out of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous being run out by the word God. One day, I don't know where it was, some during that period of time, I remember kneeling down by this lady. Her name was Elsie Faye Maroney. And she touched me on the shoulder and she said, Honey, uh, if you ever have any place to come, you can always come stay with Larry and I. And you know, that's the first time I ever remember in my life anybody ever being kind to me. Oh, I was used to being kicked and whipped, shot at, and beat with clubs, and stabbed and electrocuted. Poked at and made fun of, humiliated. I was used to that kindness I didn't understand. It baffled me. And I loved her till the day she died, more than anything that I know of, probably. And her sponsor, who gave me this program in such magnificent packages. In the sitting in this meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous one day, there was an old man who came in there with gray hair. <clears throat> put his arms around me and kissed me on the cheek. Get away from me, you old fool. <laughs> people talk bad about people who kiss each other in penitentiaries. <laughs> I didn't know when that old man kissed me on that cheek that day that he set the standard by which I'd live the rest of my life. I, I didn't know that. The man became the only father I ever knew. I thought, no, the only father I ever knew anywhere, period. You see, he died a year and a half ago. all my props and all my strengths and all my pillars in the last three and a half, four years and on. All of them. Glad what they gave me. What they infused in me. Every time I talk to them, they talk about a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. <coughs> I used to be confused sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I came here because I, you, you talk about being sober. I didn't understand that. I hear you say things like I used to drink. I don't drink anymore and everything is wonderful. I said, I'm not alcoholic then. I'm not drinking either. I'm crazy. I didn't understand that. People say to me, you got to get active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got active. I did what you told me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I ran around. I picked up ashtrays. Picked up your coffee cups. Washed your coffee cups. Smiled at you. It's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then I went back and sit in that corner back there and died. Died. I was doing everything you told me to do. Everything. And once again, the problem arose. My inside didn't match your outsides. And I was taking it. I was going nuts. So I had some anesthetic I injected myself with. I called it, I'm different. I'm not an alcoholic. I wish I was an alcoholic. If I was just an alcoholic, then I'd be all right because I'm doing these things and I'm not drinking if I was just an alcoholic. And every time I talked to you, you talked to me about a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I read your book. I stood across the room one night where I was staying in this little cell that I lived in, and I screamed out my madness, I'm different, it won't work for me. I went over and picked it up and looked up and saw the most simple statement I'd ever seen in my life. I said, how it works. <laughs> Once you know, I almost missed that. I don't know no, why. Surely I must have heard it in Alcoholics Anonymous before. They read it at every meeting in Southern California. That's where it started. Surely I, must, I didn't. I'd never heard it before. 
And right behind that, in the first paragraph of the preamble of the fifth chapter of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it tells us exactly who makes our program, who doesn't, and why not. There's no mystery to this thing anymore. It's written in a book. It says very simply, I heard it read here tonight. That lady read it so elegantly. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Period. Isn't that amazing? We run around here in Alcoholics Anonymous, or else I do, with all types of excuses why people don't stay sober. And the reason they don't stay sober is because they don't give themselves to this simple program. It's foolproof. The program is foolproof for an alcoholic like me. You know, I couldn't work the first three steps of our program of recovery, no matter how much I wanted to, because I couldn't get past the first wording of the step. The first step, I couldn't admit that I was an alcoholic. I couldn't get it out of my mouth. It wouldn't come out. It just, the prejudice and, and the denial was so thick and fat, I couldn't get that word in me. And that put up denial for all the rest of it. My life wasn't unmanageable. If I couldn't be, I couldn't just what? I just wasn't nuts. I wasn't going to turn me into a power grader. There wasn't anything greater than me. But because you told me to, and I was different, I was going to prove to you I was different, I worked the four step of a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. You've got to be careful about doing things like that. <laughs> I mean, if you're serious. If you do it the way the book says, and that's the only guideline I had, I started writing down these little nickel and dime and penny any things that I'd done all my life. Oh, not the macho deal, the money I stole, the dope I used, and the women I had, and the blob de blob de blob de blob the things you talk about in group. <laughs> I'm talking about the things you think about when you lay down there in the middle of the night and you got no anesthetic, and you think about, and you hope nobody finds out. Them kind of little deals. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at them on paper. A lifetime of corruption and filth and degradation and penny ante nickel and dime things that I'd done all my life. Laying on a piece of paper and I'm dangerous to me at that time. I don't dare shave. I'm dangerous. And what saved my life, I sat down with a man and I spent three and a half hours. I told him about me. And somewhere during that three and a half hours, I heard myself admit to this man that I was an alcoholic. It started way down deep inside of me, and it pulled all that crap out of me, and it stood me into a state of freedom that I carry with me to this very day. Because for the first time in my entire life, I knew what was wrong with me. Because by the time I got around to the fifth step in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, by the time I took that, admitted to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic, I had already read the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd already read a chapter into the solution. I'd already read about more about alcoholism. I'd read all that stuff. And I knew I had this terrible malady. If I had this alcoholism, this disease called alcoholism, and I'm an alcoholic, I've got a surefire cure for this thing, a way to keep it arrested, so I jolly well better do the things it says to do that. For the first time, I, you know, I know what's wrong with me today. Do you know how unique that is in the world? Do you understand how very unique that is, that I know what's the matter with me? I am an alcoholic. I suffer from a disease called alcoholism, and the most blessed thing that I know of is I have a surefire answer. I have a thing. I have things to do, places to go, and people who be around who help me keep this terrible malady inside of me arrested. Keep me from doing the very thing that must be kept from me doing. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous has manufactured in my life the only thing that has ever been designed to do for an alcoholic of my stature. The only thing that this program of Alcoholics Anonymous has ever been designed for, this alcoholic disease that I have, it gives me the extreme privilege for periods of my life to be completely and totally devoid of myself. Isn't that amazing? And it's not really so amazing when I read the third step prayer in the morning. It says, God, relieve me from the bondage of self, that I may be witness for those who see of your undying mercy and love. Amen. 
Help me do thy will, it says there. But it says, relieve me from the bondage of self. So I have to assume that self is a problem. It still is. Always will be. Selfishness and self-centeredness has always been my problem. I hear things in Alcoholics Anonymous I don't understand. Probably never will understand. But I do know about myself. I've had people come into my life that I try to swallow this program of Alcoholics Anonymous who've literally, literally, created what you see standing in front of you. Literally. They took a shell and added every ingredient the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer. The shell. That's what I was when I came here. I, I wasn't. I, I can't even say I was an animal. Animals don't do the things that I did. Animals have some feelings of something, some concerned about something. I had nothing like that when I came here. I'd never had it. The people of Alcoholics Anonymous, slowly but surely, by their prodding and their suggestions and the things that I did, started to infuse in me some form of dignity. Some form of it. And they started by telling me things about my language. When I came here, my language consisted of about four, four-letter words. Mother was the trigger that made it all work. <laughs> and they told me that cussing was a crutch for conversational cripples. They didn't think I was cute, and they didn't tee-hee-hee when I said one of those four-letter words. They said, we don't say it that way, Johnny. And then they stood my wrath when I rained on them. You know, they let me out of that penitentiary if I lived to Wednesday. I've had the key to my own door for 25 years. <laughs> I've been living out there for 25 years with them. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> with nothing. Nothing. I don't even take aspirins. Jesus, I just, if I took two aspirins and I didn't have a headache, I might anticipate one for tomorrow. So I take three or four. I'm really weird about that. You don't think I'm a compulsive individual? I had a small cup and a big cup of coffee sitting down there before the meeting. And I didn't know whether to bring the big one up or the little one up. I'm still not sure I made the right decision. <laughs> you know what I did when I came out of the penitentiary? I had to go to work. I had a sponsor for 22 years who went to school for hard-hearted sponsors. <laughs> I mean, he was vicious. He, was, he told me I had to go to work. I said, doing what? He said, work. I said, oh. So I went out and seen what type of opportunities there were for domino players. I looked long and hard, and nobody wanted one. <laughs> I started to stand around in street corners and snap my fingers, and nobody wanted to employ me. Really, I was so hip that the world was a drag. And people don't want to hire hipsters. And my sponsor would take me to meetings. He wouldn't let me talk in meetings. He'd tell me to shut up. I, and he didn't even know I was sensitive. <laughs> Yelled at me in the meetings. Shut up! <laughs> One night we went to hear Papa talking. Sometimes Chuck talked a long time, and I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I reached across the table very quietly, and I said to Norm, Norm, he said, shut up! <laughs> and I said, I've got to go to the bathroom. He said, sit still. <laughs> I said, I have to go to the bathroom, Norm. He said, sit still. I said, I may pee my pants. He said, so what? <laughs> Sit still. God, he was cruel to me. You know, one time he come to pick me up to take me to a meeting. It was on a hot July night, and I had a pair of shorts and a tank top on. And he wouldn't let me in the car. Drove off and left me standing. <laughs> I didn't know what to tell him. I called him up. I said, how come you didn't pick me? He said, you ain't going to a meeting dressed with me like that. 
I said, man, that's clean. He said, that ain't got nothing to do with it. Would you go to church looking like that? Tell you, the next time he came to get me, I wasn't wearing any shorts and thongs all day. Didn't like it. I showed him. I'll dress up and pay him back. I won't talk to him in the meeting either. <laughs> I won't get up and go get coffee. I'll sit there. I'll show him. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a slight. You know, it wasn't until after Norm was dead a year that I ever had any kind of an idea what he tried to teach me. In my early days in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no way of knowing. See, when you're self-centered and self as I was, and selfish, how would you understand anything? How could it penetrate that type of insanity? My sponsor was trying to teach me to have some respect for this thing that gave me my life. That's all. And the measure of respect I showed Alcoholics Anonymous is the measure of respect that I give you. That's all. For how I conduct myself. You see, I never one time when I first knew an alcoholic's knowledge ever had any kind of an idea that anybody else would be interested in listening to what was going on there. I was only interested in Norm talking to me because I was self-centered and self-seeking. I had no consideration for anybody else. See, when I got up and stumbled over people on the pretense of going to the bathroom or getting a cup of coffee, which I just couldn't live without for 30 minutes, I had no idea that somebody else may be interested in what's going on over there and I would be disturbing them. I had no way of knowing that. I had no way of knowing that the way I dressed and the way I conducted myself in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous denoted how much respect I had for this program. None whatsoever. I did. How would I know that? When you're self-centered and selfishness, you don't have those kind of thoughts in your head. I didn't. And I've been self-centered and selfish and self-seeking all my life. I never concerned myself with you or anybody else. I was only concerned about me and my well-being. And wandering into the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and fulfilling the conditions of this program of recovery didn't change that selfishness and self-centeredness overnight. I had to be prodded into doing things. I didn't know why they did them. It took me 20 years to understand that, what I just explained to you. I understand. I can sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to tell me how much you love Alcoholics Anonymous or how much you respect Alcoholics Anonymous. I can see. I'm not blind. I can see it by the things you do. I can see it by the actions you take. I can see how much you respect this thing, how much you love it. It's by your actions, by your willingness. A judgment. I can see that. The reason I can see it because I was taught that. And I didn't even know I was being taught. That's the miracle that's happened to me in Alcoholics Now, They taught me. I didn't even know I was being taught. I went to work. I had to go to work. Part of the requirement for sobriety is to become self-supporting through my own contributions. Part of sobriety. Not a tradition. It's part of sobriety. It's part of me. I have to support me and mine. That's part of the deal here. Takers like me have to. I don't know about you, you understand? See, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a taker. I have to. I have to give. I have to not take. I have to be aware of not taking. All the time, I have to keep it uppermost in my mind because I'm a born taker. Therefore, I'm a born loser. I have to. Don't you see why Alcoholics Anonymous is such a magnificent thing for a clown like me? In these meetings and in my home group and the people I sponsor, I'm forced. I'm forced to. Not by choice, but by force. I'm forced to give of myself. There's a lot of places I'd rather be than in wherever I am. In Oklahoma. True. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be with the people I'm, but there's a lot of places I'd rather be. That's the truth. Not at this instant. But if I had choices, like some people get when they get sober, I'd be home playing golf. Because after all, that's the way I choose. <laughs> I don't have choices. I came here yesterday. 
I stay here all day yesterday and all day today, and I go back tomorrow because of one thing. Because of sitting in a cell in a penitentiary a long, long time ago when I was coming into Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I said to myself, if they would allow me the extreme privilege of going and sitting in their meetings, I'll do anything they ask me to do. That's the only thing that I have ever been loyal to or have ever kept in my entire life is my commitment to you, members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, nobody's ever asked me to do anything here they wouldn't do themselves. Nobody. You know that somebody stole my first paycheck? You want to hear somebody scream? You want to hear thieves when they get stolen from? <laughs> yeah, I worked hard at that. I just, somebody stole my paycheck. Got another one. I've been getting them ever since. If I could have caught the guy who stole my paycheck, there'd be a bif- different talker here tonight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'd be up there talking in Folsom, telling how AA don't work. <laughs> <laughs> that tragedy since I've been sober. That's why I arrived. I don't know why uh, people get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and think they're immune to life. I'm not. If you're in life, you're not immune to it. How would you be immune to what everybody else is not immune to? We're not special here. I think that's the biggest ego trip that anybody could possibly ever denounce on me. For me to try to think that I'm special and I'm some of God's chosen children. I think that's sick. Why? Why would I have the audacity or the egotism to believe that I am any more one of God's children than that poor guy laying down there in El Reno, Oklahoma, who can't get sober. Just because I'm sober? That I'm more worthy of God's grace than he is? That's malarkey. My daddy in Alcoholics Anonymous, my old man who died a year and a half ago, told me that's not true, Johnny. It's not. We're all God's children. All of us. If one of us is, we all are. He said... That God made the rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust. Isn't that amazing? So what's the difference between me and that guy that's sober? Let me tell you. He don't know he's one of God's children. Nobody's ever gone and told him. Nobody's ever taught him to walk and to talk and to act like one of God's children. Though therefore he can receive his father's favors. He don't know that. And if I don't go tell him, he ain't never going to find out. So it becomes my business and my only business to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. That's my primary purpose in life. I don't have any other purpose in life. I don't want any other purpose in life. I'd rather be here with you doing what I'm doing than breathing. If I take my last breath sitting down there on that bench tonight, I have lived life's fullest treasure and experienced all of my father's treasures from the storehouse since I've been hanging around people like you. I've had it all. And I continue to get it all. My life changes and things change. I change because I'm a human being. Life changes. Ups and downs, ins and outs. That's life. I sit and watched. Made it my business for two years. Because my sponsor died and I never got to say goodbye to him. I made it business when my daddy got sick to go sit with him. I sat with him every week. And held his hand. And loved him. And hugged him and watched him die. And when he died, I loved him more than anything that's ever lived upon the face of this earth. Tell me about the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. God has surely blessed them all. Not because they're alcoholics. Just because in some strange miracle they discovered that they are one of God's children and they're starting to act like it. That's all. It's amazing to me when I started to act like God's kid, he started to treat me like his kid. When I acted like the other guy's kid, he treated me like his kid. It's amazing to me. And the reason I know that I learned that from my children. 
When I treat my youngest daughter, I, my youngest daughter is the apple of my eye. Bright, articulate, and a born dyed in the wool drunk. Whew, is she a bad drunk? She got sober for nine months now, Clark's mom. She drinking now. I took my 16 year old daughter, who I love more than life itself, when she's a senior in high school, and told her, You get out of my house. If you want to drink, that's your business. You ain't going to make me watch you. Live by these rules to leave. And I watch this girl that I love take her little bag and walk out in them streets. And I know what's out in them streets for people who pack their nose and drink that stuff and do all that stuff. You see, because there's people like me out there waiting for them. So I know. And when she was sober in her nine months, she'd sit and talk to me all the time about alcoholics and all And one thing she always said to me, she said, Daddy, I always knew. I always knew when I was out there that I could come home. I always knew that. She said, that was my ace in the hole. I always knew I could come home if I lived by the rules. I always knew that. Somehow or other, in my lifetime, I always knew I was going to be allowed to go home. I always knew it. I looked and searched, dug and fought and screamed and kicked and did everything, but I always knew somewhere I was going to be able to go home. I knew in my father's house there were many mansions. I knew that. And I knew that maybe I was going to get there. And you know the most magnificent thing happened to me when I thought I never would. When all hopes and all thoughts of me ever being able to go home was erased from me and no hope was left. You opened up the door and let me sit at the table. You brought a robe for my shoulders and sandals from my feet and you killed a fat calf. There's no reason I love you. No wonder that I love you more than anything in the world. You see, I hear people talk about God in Alcoholics Anonymous all the time. I have a tough time with it sometimes because it's humanly impossible for me to separate God, you, and Alcoholics Anonymous because I believed in you a long, long time before I ever believed in God. And many times in the last two or three years when things have been kind of dark, and the pain had been so unbearable that I didn't think I could last. And these people who I loved and worshipped were leaving. I would think about you. When I couldn't sleep and I couldn't pray and I couldn't read and I couldn't do anything and I tossed. I think about you. I think about the people I sponsored and I, and I think about old Norm and I think about people like Winnie and I, and I think about, I know that God worked in their lives. And with the knowledge that God worked in their lives, I was sure he was working in my life. And so one more time, I came to believe, I came to believe by observing what you do. And by doing what you do, I started acting like one of God's children and started receiving his rewards and his grace. A long time ago, a long time ago. There was an old guy who lived in a penitentiary. His name was John the Baptist. They had him in there. He had a cousin running around doing strange things. He called a couple of guys that he sponsored in. He said, now you go out and find out from this guy and ask him a question. Ask him if he's the Messiah. So they did. They went out and followed him around. They said to him, are you the Messiah? He didn't say nothing to him. He went on about his business. They kept questioning him all the time, you know. Are you the Messiah? He looked at him and went on about his business. You know how them old timers are, you know. <laughs> Finally, they said to him one day, John wants to know, are you the Messiah? And he looked at him and said, you go back and tell John what you've seen. Tell him that the blind see, the deep hear, and the lame walk. <laughs> Twenty-eight years ago, I was crawling around in a cell in solitary confinement. I couldn't walk. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't see. It was dark. And 
and you came and opened up the door and let me in. And now I walk with you. I hear what you say. And I see the miracles working in your life. So I do know there are all experiences that the lame do walk. The deep do hear. And the blind do see. Because I know it has happened to me here. And only here I go nowhere else. There's a guy from Oklahoma that I uh, sponsored. Who gave me a little saying that I just absolutely adore. It's a truism. One of the great truisms I've ever heard. He says, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Now that goes over big in Bellflower, but it's a little deep for Oklahoma, I'm sure. <laughs> but you think about that. You think about it. If you're sitting in this meeting, or any other meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're full of fear and frustration and you're craving and you want to break and you want to run, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting what you're getting. If you're sitting in this meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you're sitting here at peace and at ease and you're enjoying this magnificent weekend with these magnificent people, you keep doing what you're doing. And you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Now, see, I don't know about you or anybody else who lives upon the face of this earth. I'm not an authority on other people. I don't know about that. I can tell you that for me, and only for me, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I've learned to love what I'm getting. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.